Irritator Challenge Uriai is a Spinosaurid coming from Brazil. And it's honestly kind of like my feelings on the Spinosaurids, it, they irritate me. However, that's not exactly what this paper is about, instead it's more about the actual pieces of the skull we have and how they all relate to one another. The skull was found articulated, so we know how the pieces fit together, but we don't necessarily how they move together. And that's what this paper tried to find out. And so what they actually did is they used CT scans to make three-dimensional models, and they did this in pretty good detail, although the ones that they use in the images aren't as high of detail as I'd like. It's not micro CT scan, but still it's very useful. For example, you can look at figure 35 where they have the right serangular bone. You can see a number of different kinds of features here. There's the adductor fossa for moving the jaw, the glenoid fossa, another muscle attachment area, as well as some different processes that interact with the other bones. Based on this study, it seems like Irritator had some unusual things going on with the jaws, specifically because it seems like the lower jaw moved a bit when it opened. And I don't mean moved up and down, I mean moved side to side, and not necessarily like chewing either. What it seems like happened is as the jaws opened, some of the bones would actually reposition themselves slightly, meaning that the lower half of the jaw would actually spread wider than it would be when it was closed. The most extreme example of this kind of movement of different bones in the skull is going to be found in snakes. I mean, it's very easy to see them just spread their heads all over the place and suddenly you know, oh yeah, the bones in there are probably moving around a bunch too, especially relative to one another. Dinosaurs though, as archosaurs, are normally thought of as having akinetic skulls, meaning non-kinetic skulls, the pieces don't really move around a lot relative to one another. So this is something that's pretty interesting, and I do want to be fair and entirely clear here. When I talk about the jaw spreading wide, I don't mean like a snake where it unhinges from the front, it'd be more like a pelican in that it could kind of spread open and wider. That doesn't mean that it was supporting a pelican-like pouch, just that the bones on the bottom jaw may have actually split open a little bit wider. And what that means is that it was probably pretty good at swallowing mid-sized prey, at least relative to other theropods that would have been around at the time. There's an older paper on Irritator that actually CT scanned the skull and was specifically looking at the brain case, and based on what those researchers found, it probably had pretty good vision, especially when trying to track a moving object. So something that's a smaller prey item than some of the large herbivores that were around. It could track that really well and then potentially strike out at it and grab onto it. And that's where a second part of this paper comes in because it had a relatively weak but very fast bite. Dinosaur jaws are basically a lever, which means at least in general terms, we can understand them really well. They didn't actually do any like hard math on how strong the bite would have been, but they did enough to understand that, yeah, it would have been fast and also kind of weak. And that's because of where the muscles are positioned. The muscles in Irritator, when we're looking at the jaws, are positioned really, really far back in the jaw. Now, if you're thinking about this animal trying to catch something, that load, that prey item, is going to be at the front of the jaws for the most part. And then the muscles moving that are gonna be closer to the hinge. Because of that, there's not as much force you can put onto that load, onto that prey item, towards the front of the mouth. But if the jaw muscles were further forward, it could pull on that a lot tighter and bite harder. It's something that we kind of see in things like even big cats, where they've shortened their snout so that that front part of the bite is still really, really strong. And that's because the muscles are right next to where the force is being applied. And again, we don't see those muscles in Irritator, so relatively weak bite, especially compared to other theropod dinosaurs. But because it's all the way at the back, that means it could close its jaws super quick. When we're thinking about the muscles closing the jaws, they need to start pulling and tensing against one another in order to actually close the jaw. And if you're further forward in that jaw, you have to move more to close the jaw the same amount. Meanwhile, with those muscles being at the back, it just needs to close a little bit at the back and suddenly the front end closes a bunch. And that kind of close proximity to the front of the jaw with the jaw muscles is just not what we see in Irritator. But that's still okay because that's what also gives it that really fast bite. If the muscles at the back of the jaw close just a little bit at the back of the jaw, the front part of the jaw is going to close much quicker because it has more distance to cover. So that means the tip of the snout is going to be moving much quicker and it's going to be able to really, really rapidly grab onto different prey items. This gives us at least some understanding on how it probably hunted. Not necessarily the whole was it fishing thing, although probably based on what we know of other spinosaurids, what we can tell though is it probably was really good at tracking small moving prey, 
lunging out at them and very quickly biting and holding onto them. And then with that expanding lower jaw, it could swallow them whole, which would make the entire feeding process more efficient. It's less likely to get stolen by a larger theropod if you can eat it whole all at once. There's probably going to be some studies on this in other spinosaurids to see how widespread this kind of adaptation was. And there's also going to be some debate about this because the cartilage that actually goes on top of the bones that helps kind of rub those joints together without damaging the bone itself doesn't necessarily perfectly follow the bone in archosaurs. So there's still going to need to be a little bit more work to really conclusively prove this. But based on what we know, this all tracks with what we know of spinosaurids. And it does seem like, based on this paper at least, there were two distinct clades of spinosaurids. There were the spinosaurines, so things more like Spinosaurus, and the baryonychines, so things more like baryonyx from the UK. There have been a few suggestions that potentially the baryonychines weren't their own distinct group, but instead kind of just gradually evolved directly into the spinosaurines. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my taxonomy video that I'm going to be working on after this, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. So all of that said though, this paper's a really neat look at Irritator, which again is a Spinosaurid and it's kind of irritating. And it's named Irritator because this fossil was illegally smuggled out of Brazil and the fossil dealers had essentially put a bunch of plaster on it to make it look bigger and fancier. And so the people who then went to prep it had to get rid of all that plaster and actually see what was there. And they were getting very frustrated with that. However, I also already mentioned smuggled out of Brazil, which is not ideal. And that's where the ethics statement that these authors made actually comes into play, because it got some criticism. To be fair to these authors though, they had nothing to do with the smuggling of this fossil. And there have been other people who also weren't involved who have gone and studied this fossil before. So there's a long history of this fossil being studied, it's just as we've gotten closer to today, we're starting to understand better scientific exploitation. And in paleontology, that means mostly going to the global south, taking fossils, and sending them back to places like Europe or Germany, where Irritator is stored. Within the context of this fossil, scientific exploitation means that Brazil's not able to use this fossil to build up their own scientific rigor for paleontology. They aren't able to introduce students to research using this fossil. They aren't able to use it to educate people around the country about what historically used to be Brazil. The authors for this paper presented their ethics statement as being more or less neutral to this issue, which is okay, but it's not great. And to be fair to them again, they're not lawyers who are going to be dealing with German law to see if the German law cares about the Brazilian laws about this fossil needing to go back to Brazil. So. They're not necessarily going to be in charge of it that way, but they're also not in charge of the museum where the fossil is stored, which is just another part of how they're not in charge of it. And so they try to be as neutral as possible, which I can understand. But in my opinion, what they should have done is talk to some Brazilian paleontologists about their ethics statement, and potentially also talk to some Brazilian lawyers who know the laws in Brazil that talk about fossil ownership specifically, because those lawyers are going to know exactly what to say. They would be much better at making this kind of a statement. And I think that's something that we need to consider doing more in the future because having that kind of openness with colleagues from the Global South will help us to try and alleviate some of that exploitation that's been happening in the sciences. Not just paleontology, but also just broader biology. There's so much study done about animals from very different parts of the Amazon that's mostly being done in Europe or North America. The research isn't happening as much in Brazil. So it's this kind of broad exploitation that's happening in the sciences that we need to be a little bit more considerate of. And so when we're looking at Irritator as one of these examples of a specimen that's been exploited, it's been taken from the country it came from and they can't use it anymore, it is irritating to me. I mean, I already know I said Spinosaurids do irritate me and there's plenty of reasons for that but I really don't want this kind of scientific exploitation to be the main reason they irritate me.